In the last video, we spent some time understanding the nodes and your tools, the different colors and what they represent and how to connect those nodes. So now let's create a very basic comp to understand the workflow of working in batch and then rendering the end result of your comp. I'm going to hit the D key because I want to get a damage tool. I'm using this tool specifically so we can explore some of the presets that are available on certain tools. I'm still holding down my pen. I'll hold the option key and hit the shift key, and I'll just connect the main output from our clip node to the main front input of the damage tool. I will double click on the damage tool to access its parameters. Now with the damage tool, you've got, first of all, a couple different types. You see it says damage type. There's film, analog, and digital. I'll just leave it at film. So moving over under film defects, you see a whole bunch of different buttons for different defects for film. Clicking on the gray button selects that defect, but it doesn't activate it to affect the result. You need to click on this little square and make sure that it is a blue highlighted LED. That is what is going to activate the tool. With the defect selected, you can see there is an amount slider right here. But moving to the right side of the UI in our editing panel, there are a whole bunch of other parameters that you can adjust that will affect this individual defect, which is blotches in this case. So in this case, I can adjust the amount here. I can add transparency if I wanted to and so on. So for example, if I, if I click on the blue LED to turn scratches on, I could start to adjust my amount. But notice that over here, I'm still looking at the blotches parameters. So I click on scratches and I get all the parameters for the scratches. And you can come in and start to adjust this and make the different parameter adjustments that you want. But understand that this tool and many other tools will have presets that you can access and use inside of Flame. You'll see the preset button listed over here, and there's a little blue button with a triangle, which we know that means there's a flyout. I'll slide up and I'll choose the 70s preset. Now what's going to happen is we're going to receive the confirm operation dialog box because we already have adjusted this tool and Flame wants to make sure you realize that when you confirm this, the preset or the adjustments that I've already made is going to be discarded and this new preset is going to be applied to the damage tool. I'll choose confirm and then you'll see all these different parameters are preset for me because of the preset. So now if we scrub our playback, we can see the, the effect of the 70s damage tool. Now there's a hot key, a modifier key you can use. So when you apply a preset, you don't get that confirmed dialog box. And this is true in many areas of flame where something such as a action has to be confirmed. What that is, is the option or alt key. If I hold my option key down and I go back to that flyout and I'll slide up and I'll choose security camera, you'll notice that I didn't receive that dialog box. I automatically overrode the 70s preset with this new one that I just created. So now I have a totally different effect that's been applied and I didn't have to confirm that I wanted to override the existing one. Now you can also view your presets in a folder and you can look at them with thumbnails if you want. You'll do that by clicking on the preset button right there. So I click on that, not the little triangle, and I go into the folder where the presets for the damage tool are saved. There are three subfolders, three subdirectories, if you will, and you can go into either analog, digital, or film. I click on analog and we're looking at the presets as a title. That's why they're listed this way, but we can come up to the upper left corner and I'll click where it reads titles and it switches it to proxies. So now I see all the different presets for the analog. If you click where it reads subdirectories, you go back up one frame. I could also use this little arrow here or the home button. If you wanna view all of the presets at one time in this area, you can choose the scan subdirectories option and now Flame will go through all three of these folders and display the contents of all of them. So if I want to add one of these, I can hold the option key and I click on the film effect and that has been applied. Now I have that preset for the damage tool applied. All right, I'm gonna go back to my effects node. So I click on that button to access that. I'll hit the E key because I wanna get my edge detect tool. I'll just double click on it and it's added directly into my schematic. I will hold, let me move the damage down here. I'll hold my option shift to expand the front input and I'll click on the main result output for my clip node and a release. Now we have our edge detect tool and it is what's being shown in our result view. What I wanna do though is combine the main output, the main result for the edge detect 
over the damage tool. So we go back down to our tools. I hit the C key. I'll drag my comp node up. I'll hold my option shift and I'll connect the front input to the main output of the edge. Then I'm going to release the option and click on it again to get the back extension. And I'm going to click in the main result of the damage tool. So now I'm compositing the edge detect over the background, which is the damage tool. Double click on our comp node to access its parameters. You'll also notice that on the comp node, you have two mat inputs, one's for the front and one's for the back, but I'm not gonna use those in this case, but I just wanted to point it out to you for reference so that you understand you can use mats to control what is going to be comped as far as your front and your back. Down under blending, you're gonna see your different blend modes. And right now by default, it's at blend. If I click where it reads blend, I get all the different flame blend modes. Now here's another nice thing. If you're coming from Photoshop or you've used GIMP before, you can change what blend type you're gonna be using. Right now it reads flame, but that's what we're going to access. We're gonna access all the flame blend modes. And these are great, but maybe you wanna use Photoshop. So you click where it reads flame, and now you get the other options of GIMP or Photoshop. If I choose Photoshop and then I go back to my blend mode, you're going to notice I get all the different blend modes that are the Photoshop blend modes. So I'll choose screen as my blend mode. And then you have independent transparency settings for both your front and your back. Let me zoom back a little bit, control space bar inside of my schematic view. A great hotkey to know or learn when you want to move and select multiple nodes at one time is holding your option or your alt key and clicking on a node, and it's then going to select all the nodes that are upstream from that node. And then you can move them all very easily at one time. I'll go back to my effects nodes, and I wanna add a tool that is a very important tool to learn when you are using Flame. It's available everywhere, just so you understand. It's available in your timeline, it's available in batch, it's available in batch effects, it's, it, it's called the Matchbox tool. If I hit the M key, see there it is listed inside my bin. Also notice that there is a matchbox bin just by itself. So if I click on that, you're going to see all the individual matchbox tools that are available inside the matchbox tool. The matchbox is an open GL shader language, and you can create and customize your own tools and have them be part of Flame. And in just a second, I'm gonna show you a website that you can go to where you can download a ton of different Matchbox tools to add and be part of your Flame experience or your Flame tool set. But with the Matchbox bin selected, you could add or apply any one of these Matchbox tools inside of your schematic. Or I go back to all nodes and I take that Matchbox tool and I drag it into my schematic. As soon as I let go of my cursor, all the Matchbox presets, all the shaders, are going to pop up inside a dialog box, just like we saw inside of the damage tool. But there are a lot of matchbox by default that ship with Flame. And you can see again, there's a whole bunch of subdirectories, subfolders. If you want to go into each one of these independently, you can go and explore what is in each one, or you can turn on scan subdirectories. And now we're going to go and see all the possible matchboxes that are in all these different folders. You'll see two folders that start with the name Action. Action Camera Effects, Action Lens Flares. These can only be accessed and used inside the Action tool, but that's what's great about the Matchbox tool. As I said, it's available in your timeline. It's available in Batch. It's available in Action. It's applied a little different inside of Action, and we will look at that while working in the Action environment and building a 3D comp that we're gonna use as our background for our end result. I'm going to disable scan subdirectories and I just want to apply this fabric effect. So I click on that and that is now the end result of my matchbox tool. If I double click on it, you can see the parameters say size and effect. But now we need to connect our node. So I'll click the main output for my comp node and then I'll click on the main input for the matchbox tool. And now if I start to make adjustments to the size and the effect, you can see the end result inside this viewport. So here we have the end result, and I want to render this back to my desktop. Now notice though, that as I scrub through here, or I click the play button, we play this back, the batch setup is actually 100 frames long. But if we look at our clip node, we see it's only 39 frames. So the default workflow was when you step into batch, it's set up as 100 frames. Now I could easily click in this field and enter 39, and then it would match. Or if I hold the T key, remember the duration is 100 frames, okay? 
but I hold the T key and I click on this node, you'll notice that the duration just switched to match that clip node. All right, so now I want to render the end result of my comp. So we go to our effects node again. You have a write file node and a render file node. If I take the write file node and I drag it in, I'll hold Option Shift and I will connect the main result from the matchbox into the main front input of my write node. I double click on it and you'll see there is a path as to where I can render this file. If I click Change Path, I can then determine exactly where this media will be rendered to. Let me choose Exit, Export Media to close that. You can control what frames are going to be rendered, what range will be rendered. You have the option of rendering to several different sequence file formats, DPX, and so on. And if you remember, in the very beginning when we created this project, I talked about adding tokens to be part of the rendered file name. Now, right now, my write file is just named write file 75. And with it selected, you'll see where it reads, node, this is the name of that file. If I click on it, I can receive a dialog box that's asking me what I'm going to name this. I can eliminate the pattern and enter Ken, and then I can start adding some tokens, such as the date, the year, either in two different formats, the month, remember, user nickname, project nickname. I'll choose project nickname, and look what happens. Flame is going to add my project nickname as part of the name that we're going to rename. So I choose rename, and now I've renamed this, and it's ready to be rendered. I go back to the first frame, and then if I clicked render, that would generate that file with this name to this path. It's not what I'm going to do. I don't want to do that. I want to render this back to my batch renders on my desktop. So I'm going to take a render file and drag that out. And then I'm going to hold Option and Shift and do the same thing. I connect the Matchbox result to the front input for my render. I'll double click on that render node. And I can rename this, same way as we did before. I'll name this Ken. I'll put an underscore this time. And then I'll add the project nickname, like I did before. Choose Rename. Then there's different format and settings you can adjust and change if you need to, such as I'll say I want this to be 10-bit, not 16-bit. And then there's the render destination. Here's where you control where on your media panel is this rendered file going to go. By default, it's set to go to your batch reels and put it on your batch render. So remember over here on my batch shelf, I've got a reel that's called batch renders. There's no clips on her yet, but that's the default destination. With batch reels still selected as my top destination, I can choose any one of the other schematic reels or shelf reel if I wanted to, or I can create one directly from here. If I click on the top flyout, I can choose my reel groups, or I can choose a library to render this out. I'm going to leave it set to the default, batch reels, batch renders. And then when I'm ready to render, I come over here, I click render. Flame now goes through the 39 frames, generates the rendered file based on the render node settings. And if we look over at our media panel on the batch renders, there is the image we just generated. If I go back to my tools tab, there is that file that we just generated. I double click on it. I'll bring it up in the player and I can play this back if I wanted to. All right. So that's a quick overview of the batch workflow inside of Flame. I'm going to end this video with showing you the website I was referring to earlier. I'm going to jump over to my browser. This website is logic with a K dash matchbook.org. This is a location where you can access all of these matchbox shaders for free. You can download them independently if you wanted to, or you can just download the entire collection, unzip it on your system, and then access it from within Flame. You can also share shaders that you might have created. So it's a great resource to know about when you're using Flame. Let me just click back on my Flame to go back to that. So that brings this video to an end. In the next video, we start to build the actual composite that's going to be the end result of this tutorial.